Hi, everyone. Welcome to our apartment investing podcast. We are Cohen Esri Apartment Investors. Um, and today we have Lee Harris, our president and CEO, as well as Ryan Huffman, our chief operating officer. My name is Lydia Kincaid. I'm managing director for our market rate co-invest funds. Today we're going to go through a case study of a, a fairly recent acquisition that we made um, with a property just outside Chicago. The property is called Elmhurst Terrace. I think this is really a great story. And of course, there's a story for all of them, right, Ryan? Uh, but this one has a really interesting story from the beginning, from searching out um, all of the data that we could find about the particular area, um, even to the you know mile or two square mileage of where this property is located and some of the cool things that we've done on site at this property. So Ryan, maybe if you could launch us with our initial, um, even prior to due diligence, um, what we liked about this area and this property. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to do that. So Chicago's obviously Midwest, it's a good market. You know, Lee and I would both tell you, you know, while Chicago is good, you gotta be very careful with where you go. Um, not only from just an area standpoint, but you got different regulations if you're in actual Chicago itself, or, or Lee, I think we usually talk about Cook County. The regulation there and what you're required to do is is quite a bit more stringent even than maybe you are in the suburbs. So um, it had always been on the list. What's interesting is our, our equity partner, our workforce housing equity partner, had a specific need in Chicago from a, from a Community Reinvestment Act or CRA standpoint. And so that's what really probably directed us more to to really increase the hunt in Chicago. We, we found this property and it's, it's in an area called Elmhurst. Um, Elmhurst is a fairly affluent suburb of Chicago, just kind of right outside the, the main Chicago loop. What we liked about this property, so it was built in 1947. So it's definitely, you know, an older vintage asset, but had been improved over time. Um, and what's really fascinating here is A, the household incomes were about 110,000 uh, average in that general area. And the property was studios, junior ones, ones and two. So it really lent itself well to a more workforce housing um, type of play. The other thing that we liked about this specific location is that Elmhurst is very, very restrictive on allowing new housing to be built to the point that since 1992, only 138 apartments have been built in that area. So that's a that's a real winner for us. And, and Lee and I can talk, Atlanta's very similar to this, um, but just because of the regulation and, and what people need, there's a housing need there that could be met. So um, the screening on this was really, really good. Um, they had already proven their value add. That was the other thing that caught our eye. And I think, you know, I've said this in other podcasts, value add for us has to be clear. Clear means it's either been tested or it's it's prevalent in the submarket. Here, they'd started an interior program and 42.5% of the units had been renovated on the interior and they'd, they'd proven out their $150 rent lift. So that was all really attractive from the very beginning before we ever got into diligence. Thanks, Ryan. Ali, do you want to add anything um, about the selection process prior to the acquisition? Well, I think Ryan's absolutely correct about the Chicago market generally. Uh, there's a lot of things that you have to be careful about. Obviously, that Chicago market really extends east into Indiana. Uh, Gary, Indiana is a suburb, and, uh, and it extends north into Wisconsin. Uh, it's a big, big metro. Uh, a lot of small suburbs. Uh, uh, one of the things we like about this particular community is it's it's on the the rail line, uh, fairly close. Ryan, I can't remember how many blocks away from the property uh, the rail line is, but it's not that far. So you could you could literally live at this property, and I think I don't know that you could walk it, but you'd have to drive a short way and uh, and and you could be downtown in fairly short order if you if you uh, get on the L uh, but yeah the, the, the thing that I think struck us uh, as quite unique is this household income uh, within uh, such a, a, a small radius of the property I don't know that we have any other properties that we've acquired that have household incomes that high and there's also Ryan uh, some some nice retail. I can't remember the who who are some of the retailers that are right around the corner from the property. 
Yeah, it's all the big box stuff, right? There's a Kohl's right next door. There's a, a kind of a shopping. It's it's called the Elmhurst Crossing Shopping Center. There's a Whole Foods right there. So it it really is a great little area that you could, from there, Lee, to your point, that, that walkability is great because you literally walk right across the street and you've got all of these big box retail amenities right there for you. Yeah, and I think I think the, that we're at a, a, a phase in the market uh, where amenities are a big deal. I mean, uh, that's driven a lot of this whole lifestyle of choice notion that, uh, that we buy into, uh, that, that there's not just the on-site amenities, but you also have uh, neighborhood amenities. And, and this property is laden with neighborhood amenities uh, where the retail and the restaurant uh, opportunities are concerned. So as we selected uh, this property to, to pursue for acquisition, not only did we see the, the upside in, in potential amenities at the site, but also in the immediate surrounding neighborhood. So speaking of amenities, let's talk about the property itself. Um, typically, we use a five-year plan um, with the properties that we acquire in order to do the renovations on the first half, if you will, um, of that five-year plan, and then continue to increase rents and stabilize the resident base, um, wait until the end of that five-year, and then sell the property. Um, Ryan, maybe you can talk about the business plan for this one and how it was similar or different um, from what we typically do, especially given that this was an older property? Yeah, this one was a little bit different. So, you know, one of the things I'll, I'll kind of say in that is that the hold period is typically five years. We're typically doing our reno program in the first two years, um, both interior and exterior. Um, and then, you know, we've got three years of runway to see how the market's doing and, and when's the time to sell or recycle the asset. This particular asset, we, we took a longer term look and largely because of the need of the equity partner. So this is actually underwritten on a 10-year hold um, versus a five-year hold. We had a very similar strategy with the renovation, though what is really starkly different about this one is a bulk of our money. So we were spending about $10,000 a unit on the renovation to get $150 lift. A bulk of that money, meaning probably I think 75% of it, was all exterior and amenity-based. Um, and remember, in the first part of the podcast, I said they'd already done roughly 42.5% of the units. So we only had to bring kind of the remaining, call it 57.5% up to, the, to up to the level they had them at. And then we took the other that they'd already done and just juiced it with some countertops and some other things so that everything was on the same level. But we really needed to change the look and feel of the property. Um, and, and Lee may laugh at this, but it, it, it looks like Chicago property. I mean, that's what it is. It's 1947. It's brick exteriors. You know, we had green shutters on it and it sits right in the heart of this area of Elmhurst where all the houses are being torn down and rebuilt with these brand new, nice homes. You've got the great retail next door. So we actually executed that strategy and, and the results have been phenomenal. Everybody's been pleased with it. The city, the, the limited partner, um, we totally redid the look of the exterior by putting some caps on the ends, um, totally changed the color scheme, totally changed the signage. What was unique about this one is, you know, if you look at it on an aerial, it's kind of in this interesting, I'm going to call it a rectangle. And there's four quads that are inside the property. So picture the buildings on a perimeter of the street and then the parking's all in the middle. And that creates these quads. And only one quad had amenities. And so we were able to add fire pits to one quad and we added playground equipment to another quad. So each quad now has a very unique setting that all of the residents can use. So it allowed us to really boost those amenities um, on that property just from the layout of, of the plat of land. Well, I think too that uh, what we've done there is uh, working because the property's full you know, from an occupancy standpoint. And the revenue growth, not just the rental rates, but the revenue growth year over year through June <clears throat> was 20.2%. Yep. I mean, that's just phenomenal. Uh, it's, it's also certainly the, the market, the apartment market is that way now. I mean, we're seeing very, very large rent growth, but for overall revenue to be up that much year over year, 
is uh, is is quite a testament to the success that we've had based on the the, the, the plan that uh, that we put into place and the fact that we're uh, creating this lifestyle of choice that we've talked about several times in the past. So Ryan, how how much more do we still have yet to complete? Are we completely done with all renovations, interior and exterior of that property? So we're not completely done. And, you know, we say it's two years. That's based on roughly a 50% turnover rate. Obviously, the pandemic hit and really we took a very defensive approach to the entire portfolio. So we halted renovations for a, a short period of time. We really focused on keeping folks there and you really didn't have a lot of folks leaving. So we do still have a, a relatively small number of the interior renovations to complete folks that have just been there for a while and haven't moved. Um, and what's really fascinating is even evenly with those 20.2% revenue growth, you're not seeing heavy turnover at the property. Our retention rates are well into the 60s. So, you know, just finishing that out, the exterior is completely done. It was completely done in the, in the first six to 12 months that we had the property under control. So a bulk of the money is already spent and we're just dealing with kind of that last, what I call just the last pieces of the rent roll. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, so moving on from here, this being a longer term hold, then how much longer like do you anticipate these renovations to be made before it's, you know, steady? I mean, it's fairly steady now. I would say we probably have another 12 months maybe before I could tell you 100% of the renovations are complete, meaning we've done every single unit. Um, but beyond that, from there, it'll just be ride the cash flow and ride the rent increases. And when we reach a point in this that a sale seems likely or a recycle seems to be the best scenario, that's that's the direction we'll take. We're, we're probably not there yet because we're seeing such good growth in the revenue and you're still playing a bit of catch up from that pandemic overhang effect where we're not quite ahead of our pro forma, but we're real, real close, which is a, a testament to the not only the strength of that market, but the property and the team as well. For sure. So is this a market that we would look for again? And we, we like to try to find economies of scale and acquire multiple properties in the same markets. Is this one of those or was this so specific to the LP that this would be our only asset there? I, I'll answer that by saying we love the market. Now we can love the market and the market can't love us. <laughs> and what I mean by that is this specific asset, you know, 1947 Chicago, we bought it for $130,000 a door back in, in 2019. To go in there with a, a different strategy on a different property with our other LPs gets to be real difficult in Chicago just because the price points in, in that market are so exorbitantly high. It, we just can't compete, generally speaking. Don't get me wrong. We still look at everything that comes out of there. And, and there's very specific submarkets in Chicago. We'd look Elmhurst, Naperville. Um, it was kind of outlying what I call the bedroom communities of Chicago. Um, but it's also us and a lot of other people. So we definitely aren't going to color outside the lines, even though you do have a strong a strong showing in Chicago. Um, you know, that's, that's my take, Lee. I don't know how you're, you generally feel about, about that, but that's. Now, I, I would tell you that <clears throat> this is, you know, part of our strategy when we buy a property in a market is uh, that we need to have the economy of scale and the efficiency with a single asset. So we don't have to, to buy anything else in that market. This property has 312 units. It's big enough to, to, to be, relatively self-contained, uh, and, and we like that. Uh, that doesn't mean that we wouldn't buy another property that's smaller, but we already have the one that's larger, so that would make some sense. But again, right now, I think we're in a, a, a situation where we're being patient from an investment standpoint. Uh, as we've talked about on, uh, on the prior podcast, uh, we've got a, a real volatile situation here right now with interest rates, uh, what that's done in terms of kind of creating a pause in the market where sales are concerned. A lot of, uh, of sellers have said, OK, we're going to step back and we're not going to we're not going to put our property on the market because we don't know how this is all going to shake out in terms of valuation uh, with interest rates on the uptick that definitely means that there's going to be some sort of, of repricing of, of these assets. Uh, interestingly, the apartment industry is not 
I, it's not been a bubble situation because demand has been so incredibly strong. Uh, we're seeing the, the rent increases. We certainly see cost increases too, but they're, they're, the cost increases aren't as, as great as the rent increases. Uh, and uh, probably we're at historic highs as evidenced by Elmhurst Terrace in terms of occupancy. So when we, when we uh, model a property in the underwrite, we're looking at a 92, 93% economic occupancy typically, and we're running well over that, uh, 95, 96, even 97%, and maybe more in some of, some of our assets. Uh, and we're generally modeling 3%, I'm generalizing here, but generally looking at 3% rent growth. And again, we're seeing rent growth that's much higher than that. And when I say rent growth, I should say revenue growth, uh, overall revenue growth at 3% or so, maybe 3.5% in some markets. Well, we're seeing 9, 10, 12%, in this case, 20.2% year over year. That's not something that's sustainable necessarily, but it certainly can push you ahead of your projections, uh, which is always good because if, if, if cap rates or yield to cost numbers are, are uh, going the wrong direction, beating our net operating income projections uh, is a good thing uh, as early in the, the holding period as possible. So uh, we like being in this particular market uh, because it's a good core market. It's a, it's a, it's not a tertiary market. Uh, the assets older than what we would normally purchase, but again, there's a story. And in a market like this, uh, there is a lot of this kind of housing and it's in high demand. So would we buy a 1947 product in Atlanta? Probably not. Or Dallas? Probably not. But in Chicago, it definitely makes sense. I think that's an important delineation too, Lee. It's it, people that are in Chicago are used to this vintage of multifamily housing. And it doesn't mean it's original to 1947. In fact, most, if not all of it, has been renovated over time. And sometimes there's been multiple cycles of that. But, but the bones of that brick construction are just really, really good, particularly in that Chicago area. Yeah, and let's talk for a minute about the competition from single family homes. In a market like Chicago, single family is, I would, I have always felt that the, that the single family uh, competition to apartments has been less than it might be in Kansas City or it might be in Indianapolis or even Minneapolis. Uh, Chicago is much more of an urban center. It's a, it has more of an urban feel uh, it's very, very much more dense than it is in some of these other cities that I just mentioned. So <clears throat> as far as, you know, single family being competition, here's something that's interesting. Uh, the median home price, and this is on a nationwide basis, and it's based on the Federal Reserve economic data, the median home price in 2022 is $428,700. The average is $507,800. So if you have a 5.5% interest rate on a 30-year 30, 30 fixed rate mortgage, uh, and you can scramble together that 10% down payment, which in this case, if we use the, the, the median price, the lower of the, the valuations, that's $43,700 bucks. And a $385,000 loan would require principal and interest of $2,186. Taxes and insurance on average would run at $7,500 per year. So that's uh, when, you, when you make that calculation, and I would uh, posit that in Chicago, these numbers are probably higher, both the median income or the median uh, uh, home price and probably the tax and insurance numbers are higher. But let's just use this national average. You're looking at $2,800 a month uh, plus utilities, maintenance, and repairs, you're looking at $2,800 a month to own the median price house. The average national effective rental rate is $1,718. It's, it's a, over $1,000 less. Here in this particular uh, market, in this particular property, our effective new executed rent 
is 1,340 bucks. So we are so far below what it would cost someone to own a single family home that unlike in the past when we saw single family homes as our biggest competition where people would, would to give their notice to vacate and say they're buying a house, it's just not the same as it used to be. I don't know, Ryan, if you want to add to that, but it's it's really interesting in a in an urban market like this, how we're seeing uh, our rents are still substantially below where you would be with just a, a national average on the on the median priced home. No, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, <clears throat> we all know, and just intuitively, you know, Chicago housing is is astronomically expensive because of the density. Um, let alone anything else. And this, the play on this property, by the way, it's unlikely that we're going to lose people to either buying a home or going out and renting a home. The, the profile of this property, we've got some college students that live here. We've got workers that are working right there in Elmhurst that need an affordable place to live and want to be right there where they can walk to work or drive very short distances. And so having that variant compared to what you, you would normally have is important for this, for this type of product. This is not restricted product. Uh, so it is a market rate community. It's simply positioned differently than, than you would be positioning a high rate asset. Lee and Ryan, I think, I think that's a great point. And that really ties this all together about uh, such an important part of the story for this property um, and why we acquired it as well. I mean, besides just a cost perspective too, when people just aren't able to get loans like they used to. They don't have the capital on hand. Lee, you alluded to that, being able to make a down payment. People just don't have that kind of cash. Um, they're overburdened with student loans or other types of debt, um, and they're just not in a position to be able to do that. So, um, Well, and, and not only that, but, but the, this whole thing's flipped around where it's lifestyle of choice now because it's amenitized so heavily, both on-site and in this case, in the surrounding neighborhood. I mean, the, that's a big, big deal from, you know, 47 years ago when I started in this business, you know, you had scant amenities. It wasn't a big deal. Everybody wanted to say they had a swimming pool, but nobody used it. Uh, and so you had a swimming pool and you might have a tennis court, but there were no fitness centers and none of the other kind of things we're talking about now. And, and everybody aspired to own their own home back in the day. And that's, that's changed completely. It really, it, and I think a lot of that has to do with the amenitizing of our industry in concert with the fact that it's just gotten so expensive to own a home. Uh, people love the apartment lifestyle and they love Elmhurst Terrace. Yeah, I think it's hard to justify leaving a place where you have all these great amenities and great things to do and you've got a community there. Um, so, I mean, yet again, I think this is a great time um, for us to be involved in this industry. But guys, thanks a lot for, for your time today and thanks everyone for listening. Talk to you next time. Uh -huh.